In this video, we are going to look at the commonly missed topics from Unit 6, which is thermodynamics. Specifically, we're going to focus on topics 6.4 and 6.7, as those were the most missed in the progress check, but we will also talk about some other topics as well as important equations within thermodynamics. So before we get into thermo, I just want to remind you about one very important thing when we're doing math, and that's significant figures. So don't forget about significant figures when you're doing calculations. Remember that when you are adding or subtracting, you should be rounding your answer to the least number of decimal places. And when multiplying and dividing, you round your answer to the least number of significant figures. So if we look at this data off to the right hand side, we have the initial temperature and we have the final temperature. So let's first figure out what these measurements are. Here's 20, 25, 26. So it's not at 25, not at 26. Remember when you're measuring, you measure what you know and you estimate one place past that. So we know it's 25, which means we can estimate one decimal place past. So I'm going to say that the initial temperature is 25.5 degrees Celsius. The final temperature, it's right on the line. So it's right on 20, which means if it's exactly on 20, you still estimate one place past, which means you do 20.0 degrees Celsius. You can only ever estimate one place past what you absolutely know. So if we are trying to figure out what the change in temperature is, it's 20.0 minus 25.5. The least number of decimal places is 1. So when you do final minus initial, you should be rounding your answer to 1 decimal place. When you multiply and divide, that's when you look at significant figures. So a general overview of Unit 6, which again in the AP curriculum is thermodynamics. This has all nine topics. 6.2 and 6.6 .6 were not covered in the progress check, so I am going to talk just a little bit about each of those, as well as some other commonly missed ideas or topics within thermodynamics or thermochemistry. So we're going to start looking at topics 6.1 and 6.2. We're going to tie exo and endothermic processes together with energy diagrams. So these energy diagrams should look familiar from kinetics. We have our reactants, we have our products. You could see the activation energy, which is from reactants all the way up to the transition state. However, we're just going to focus on the delta H here. So an endothermic process, remember that heat goes into the system. So heat is absorbed by the system as a positive value of delta H or a positive Q. And an endothermic process, work is also done on the system. So the system is always absorbing energy. Now we are going to use the terms heat and energy interchangeably, even though they are different, AP does not require you to know the difference between internal energy and heat. So an endothermic process, heat is absorbed. So what that means is you have the reactants here. The reactants will absorb energy, meaning that the products are at a higher energy than the reactants. So diagram A shows us an endothermic process. The products are higher in energy because the reactants had to absorb energy. In exothermic process, heat exits the system. So heat is released from the system to the surroundings. Remember when we're talking about absorbed and released, we're always talking about the system. So heat is released from the system into the surroundings. Delta H is less than zero, so delta H is negative and Q is negative, or work is done on the surroundings. So if we look at diagram B, notice how we have the reactants and the products are in lower energy, which means to get from the reactants to the products, the reactants have to lose energy. And so since the reactants have to lose energy, diagram B represents an exothermic process. Now something just to keep in mind, when you are looking at a solid dissolving in water, so when you're looking at solution calorimetry, remember that the thermometer is part of the surroundings. So when you are taking the temperature, you're actually taking the temperature of the surroundings. The temperature of the solution increases. The solution is the surroundings. So if the temperature of the solution increases, what does the system have to do for the surroundings temperature to increase? Well, that means the surroundings are gaining heat, which means the system had to release heat. So you always have to think about solution calorimetry just a little bit different. So when we're looking at heat capacity and calorimetry, this is topic 6.4, I believe. When we're looking at Q versus delta H, remember that Q versus delta H are two different things. Q just wants the heat. So it just wants joules or kilojoules for a specific amount of substance. So if a question asks you to calculate the value of Q 
that means that they're referring to the magnitude of heat that is absorbed, so they just want the value of Q. They don't normally ask for a sign of Q, but remember that your units for Q are either joules or kilojoules. If a question asks you to calculate the enthalpy, delta H, then you should include the sign of delta H, and remember that delta H takes into account the moles. So to solve for delta H, you typically will take your value of Q and divide by the moles of the substance. And so delta H is going to be either kilojoules per mole or kilojoules per mole of reaction. Remember that in calorimetry, this is coffee cup calorimetry when we're using the styrofoam cup. We're always going to assume that the styrofoam cup is perfectly insulated and that no heat is lost to the surroundings, which means the first law of thermodynamics applies. So the heat lost by one substance is equal to the heat gained by another. For example, if we put hot copper metal into water, the heat lost by the copper is gained by the water. That's always a source of error in calorimetry. If the lid is off, if heat escapes, then you're not going to have the first law of thermodynamics applied because you're not, you don't have a perfect system. You don't have a perfectly insulated system. Something else to remember uh, is the difference between specific heat capacity and molar heat capacity. Specific heat is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So for example, water has a specific heat of 4.184. So that means it takes 4.184 joules to heat one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Metals have much lower specific heats. Metals take less energy to heat one gram by one degree Celsius, which is why we see a much larger change in temperature when you put hot copper into room temperature water. The hot copper has a much higher temperature change than the water, even though the heats are equal. And then molar heat capacity just replaces one gram with one mole. So enthalpy of reaction, this is something that people tend to struggle with, and this was not on the progress check. So enthalpy of reaction, when we have delta H of reaction, our units are kilojoules per mole of reaction. The mole of reaction here could depend on whatever substance we're looking at. Now, there are a couple different ways we could calculate. We could use thermochemical equations, so we could use stoichiometry and the enthalpy given to convert to another substance. So that's when we're using the delta H equals a certain number of kilojoules per mole, and that delta H allows us to go between kilojoules and moles. Or we could do calorimetry. So we calculate Q, and then we divide by the number of moles in order to get delta H. Another way is we could use Hess's law. Now this example over here on the side is an example of Hess's law, which we're not going to get into specifically because most people did pretty well on that topic in the progress check. But if you notice here, it says HCl can be synthesized from H2 and Cl2 as represented above. Uh, if you're studying the kinetics, here's a mechanism. So it says we're studying the kinetics and they give, you, they give us a mechanism, but notice that they say, what is the value of the enthalpy change per mole of HCl produced? So here's our overall equation. We need to manipulate these three steps to get to this overall equation. So if we try to get to this overall equation, we have Cl2 and H2 already on the reactant side. We have HCl already on the product side. So all we have to do is actually add all of these up because the Cl's cancel, the H cancels. And when we add all of these up, we add up the delta H values. Now when we add up these delta H values, what we actually will get is negative 186 kilojoules. That's not actually the answer because this specifically says what is the change per mole of HCl. Well, this negative 186 kilojoules is for two moles of HCl produced. So if we divide our answer by two, we get negative 93 kilojoules. So you always want to pay attention to what your delta H represents. Our delta H here, if it's kilojoules per mole of reaction, well, we have two moles of HCl produced for one reaction that's run, so we have to divide by two. So you always want to make sure that you pay attention to your units. Bond enthalpies was another topic, and bond enthalpies and heats of formation, people tend to use the same equation, but you cannot. So for bond enthalpies, Bond enthalpy or bond energy just represents the energy required to break a bond or form a bond. So remember that breaking bonds takes energy. So if I have a stick and I want to break it, it takes energy for me to break it. 
that means that I have to put energy into it so it's endothermic. Forming a bond releases energy, so that's exothermic. So to calculate delta H of reaction from bond enthalpies, you're going to use this equation. So delta H of reaction equals the sum of the bonds broken minus the sum of the bonds formed. And then you just use the bond enthalpies that you're given. You always have to be given bond enthalpies, same with heats of formation. When you are trying to calculate delta H, you will need to have the Lewis structures drawn so that you can actually count how many bonds you're breaking and how many bonds you're forming. But also don't forget to take into account the coefficients. So if you have a two or a three out front, make sure that you're multiplying those bonds accordingly. So some important thermodynamics equations and other information. When you want to calculate heat from a calorimetry experiment, you'll use MC delta T, but also remember the first law of thermodynamics says that the heat lost by one substance is gained by another. If you are calculating delta H of reaction, make sure you're dividing by the moles. We already talked about taking the temperature of a solution. Remember that that is the surroundings. And then to calculate delta H from heat of formation. For heat of formation, this is on your equation sheet. Delta H of reaction is the sum of the heat of formation of products minus the sum of the heat of formation of reactants. Don't forget to take into account coefficients. So you're gonna multiply your coefficients accordingly. But remember that the heat of formation of a pure element in its most standard state is zero. So if you are not given a heat of formation, it could be because it's zero. And then finally, to calculate delta H from bond energies or bond enthalpies, you do the sum of bonds broken minus the sum of bonds formed. If you do not have these starred or labeled on your equation sheet or written on your equation sheet, this bond energy equation is not on your equation sheet, make sure that you write those down. So to make sure that you are getting the maximum number of points possible, uh, some things with free response questions, this thermodynamically favorable we shouldn't have to use because delta G is not on the AP test. Make sure when you are doing free response questions that you are not forgetting about your signs. So don't forget to make sure if it's negative that you put that negative. So don't, don't accidentally drop a sign when it needs to be there. Remember that Q is heat, delta H is enthalpy. So they are not the exact same thing. Delta H is the enthalpy change for a reaction. Q is just the amount of heat that is exchanged. Remember when you're using MC delta T, make sure you're using the mass of the entire solution if it's solution stoichiometry. Remember that you should always be using your thermometer to find delta T. Don't forget about significant figures. And then bonds broken minus bonds formed. And then when you are doing broken minus formed, you are taking into account the coefficients.